I'm back with another episode of the InfoSec and Nelson Show. I'm Josh Amishab. This is episode 70. Anyone who follows InfoSec news has probably become desensitized to the almost daily reports of huge unsecured databases left online. One of the more known researchers who specializes in finding open databases is Volodymyr Dyachenko, aka Bob. What really amazes me about his research is that it doesn't involve anything sophisticated. My three main takeaways from a conversation were one, how he finds open databases, two, how he stays on the legal side when verifying his research, and three, some cyber hygiene suggestions to prevent allowing unauthorized access to your critical infrastructure. You'll enjoy those who think plus a bunch of the tips along the way. Direct support for this podcast comes from BreachSense, the data breach monitoring platform. More details can be found at BreachSense.io. And now here's my conversation with Bob. Bob Diachenko, welcome to the show. Hello, and thanks for having me. So we always start the show uh, this, with the same question. Who are you and what do you do? So to put it simply, I'm a security researcher with an aim to make the internet a bit safer place than it is now by employing responsible disclosures, by finding exposed stuff without using much sophisticated techniques to find the stuff. And... Uh, yeah, uh, prevent bad things from happening by informing companies uh, that they have something leaked, exposed to public internet. Yeah, what I always find really amazing about your research, and you kind of glossed over it, you hinted to it, is you're not using any sophisticated means, but the data that you find is mind-blowing. How, how did you get started in, in security and how, how did you get started finding breaches? It all started with a data breach uh, in a company where I used to work prior to my security uh, discovery endeavor. So I worked in a company in a PR and communications department. So I was uh, pretty away from, uh, from all those security stuff and such. Uh, but one day, uh, a security researcher uh, came out of nowhere and alerted us that our company had a pretty large amount of users' information exposed to public internet. Uh, and so f- I was responsible for managing all those internal, external communications. And uh, behind all this mess, uh, one question appeared in my head, how did it happen? Why it did it happen? So I started to learn more about how such an exposure could have taken place and uh, how that security researcher uh, discovered it. Yeah, I ended up uh, learning a bit more, starting to use search engines to identify similar exposures that uh, happened to other companies, not only mine. And uh, after a year or, or two, uh, I decided that it is time for me to move on and start my own endeavor, uh, my own journey into security world and uh, start sharing my, at that time, not so big knowledge and insights about uh, stuff that I see. But I really wanted to start sharing it as, uh, as soon as possible in order to educate somehow other users like myself uh, and help them prevent uh, similar things from happening or even worse things from happening. So it all started the data breach and then step by step, I found myself uh, where where I am now uh, with all this uh, uh, reputation and noise uh, around that uh, and uh, yeah that's pretty fascinating and uh, mind-blowing at some points so to find stuff that's that's uh, can be simply found anywhere on the internet and uh, yeah try to be a good guy so let's talk a bit about the the process is you find a lot of open open servers um are, are you specializing in mongodb and elastic db is, is that right not really uh i have several so to say pillars or areas to to watch for because it's uh, nearly impossible to cover everything that's 
might be exposed. But uh, uh, these days, I really try to expand my uh, focus and try to cover uh, different stuff. It all started with MongoDBs and Elasticsearch stuff, of course, because these are uh, the, the instances, databases that are pretty easy to, to, to search for, and the information there is well-structured, and there are no special skills or tools needed in order to query those. So for example, Elasticsearch, you can browse in your in your browser uh, like normal uh, web page and uh, search for data there uh, just like browsing through your uh, regular html page so that's that's the the beauty of that uh, and uh, at the same time it creates a lot of uh, difficulties uh, in securing that from uh, from developers point of view so uh, nowadays, I also look into Amazon S3 buckets, uh, uh, Microsoft Blobs, Azure, Azure Blobs, Google Cloud, uh, a number of NoSQL databases, uh, CouchDB, for example, uh, Cassandra, uh, a couple of more. Okay, so. could we talk a bit about like the technical process? to find them. So if you go to a place like Shodan or Census or probably some of the common search engines and then searching for like uh, port, uh, whatever port Elasticsearch or MongoDB runs on, at that point, you, you'll come up with a list of potential targets. And then I would imagine the, the hard work is then going through to see, is there anything interesting on those? How does that, is there, how does that work in terms of, I guess, scaling it in terms of, uh, and then I want to talk a bit about the, the actual disclosure process. Right. At the very beginning, I used only one search engine that was there. It was Shodan. Uh, nowadays, there are five or six uh, pretty similar engines. However, they all uh, operate in different... Uh, they all have mm, some perks and features uh, which in combination help me us to uh, come up with uh, a bit more results and uh, search for non-default ports and non-usual instances still uh, remaining within the same non-sophisticated area of searching so we we sometimes use even google dorks uh, or um, public other bing search engine dorks to identify uh, scanned uh, IDs or documents online or uh, uh, indices, FTP servers uh, without passwords, so even Google can index that. But uh, all those instances, uh, S3 buckets, uh, Elasticsearch and others, at least most of them are pretty easy browsable, as I, as I, as I, as I mentioned. So uh, And uh, most of the search engines, they they provide you with a lot of information about the data. Uh, so you, in most cases, you don't need to deep dive into the instance without physically accessing it uh, by simply browsing through data feed that comes from a search engine. For example, Shodan or Binary Age, they provide pretty straightforward and user-friendly um, metadata structured uh, in, a, in a really user-friendly way with the collection names, with uh, uh, folders names. So you can also search for keywords. And in case you see something like patient's data or water's information, uh, sometimes people like to name folders uh, pretty straightforward. There is a clear indication that something is there and you need to uh, take a peek and to, yeah, browse through through the folders. No laws broken, no lines crossed. Everything you do, I do, is uh, within legal boundaries, so we don't uh, brute force uh, or somehow penetrate the system using default passwords. We only access that stuff that's uh, non password protected so it's pretty much like browsing a web page 
So you don't need any additional uh, keys or secrets to access that. So it's all there. Yeah, that's a inter- very interesting point you bring up in terms of the legal perspective. So like something like Elasticsearch where it's really just looking at your browser the same as browsing anything else, but it just happens to be the browser interface. Um, that makes a lot of sense. If you look at something like MongoDB where you have to use like a client, but again, there's no password. Are there any, and I guess imagine legal issues would probably be based on where you're located and where the target's located and it gets it gets murky, but is the red line, if it has a password, it doesn't have a password or are there other things that should be taken into consideration before a researcher digs deeper? Yeah, MongoDB requires uh, an external client to, to browse through data. But like I said, uh, most of search engines that I use, they already provide you information about the collections, about the file structures and the size of the database. For example, if you see a pretty large data set, uh, several gigabytes with a, with a collection named users or, or logins or passwords, uh, then, uh, yeah, you, at least for myself, I decided that uh, I would better view those files uh, in order to identify the owner and prevent uh, something worse from happening. So that's, uh, I know that that might look uh, a bit uh, in the gray area of uh, accessing, but Still, there is no passwords. There is uh, nothing in there, and uh, action need to be taken uh, promptly in order to identify the owner and follow responsible disclosures. So we we don't store uh, all this information on the computers. We only analyze the samples in real time and uh, save several screenshots in order to confirm uh, the, the 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 fact that it was uh, exposed and set without passwords because many companies they they simply don't believe that it happened they they still sure that this is behind firewall or uh, somewhere in local network uh, but in reality it is indexed by search engine and this data it's not dame, dummy data it's not test data it's real data proven by our screenshots and uh, alerted by responsible disclosure protocol. Yeah, definitely. If you don't alert the the owner or find the owner, every, criminals already have access to it. It's already open and it's already been indexed by several search engines. They're obviously not aware of it. Somebody needs to uh, to give them a heads up. But by the way, for S3 buckets, I know there are a lot of tools on GitHub that kind of brute force various names, I guess that would be the right way to, to phrase it in order to find them. Are you able to use the, like the Shodan and the, the senses, are you able to use those to find S3 buckets as well? S3 buckets, uh, at some point they were, so to say, my favorite uh, area to look for because uh, uh, earlier days you might come up with uh, uh, an exposed and publicly available bucket by simply uh, putting a company name in front of uh, uh, the bucket name. Uh, so company name dot S3 dot Amazon AWS dot com. And voila, you're there browsing through uh, some files that should not be there. Yeah, nowadays there are a lot of tools there that could help you to uh, identify exposed um, buckets, not only uh, Amazon uh, owned by, uh, but for example, DigitalOcean, they also have similar structure and there are way more unprotected stuff that Amazon has, for example. Uh, It's simply not so well reported uh, uh, by these days. However, Shodan, Binary Age, uh, Zoomai, uh, and yeah, those are three engines that also provide you with the capability to search for exposed uh, S3 buckets by utilizing some some dorks. So uh, there is also a specialized uh, engine called Greyhat Warfare, where all those buckets uh, indexed and uh, made searchable. So that's pretty powerful thing that uh, someone's created 
anonymously and made it for public uh, view in order to raise awareness on, on that issue. So we use that engine as well. Plus, there are many Google dorks that help you to uh, find those Google indexed buckets. And uh, yeah, they, they are pretty, pretty straightforward. Additionally, there is a public uh, source code search engine. I think it's called public www, where you can also simply browse for s3.amazonaws.com and come up with tons of results. Another question would be uh, that uh, open bucket not necessarily means that there is a sensitive information there because most companies made those buckets uh, publicly intentionally. So there are a lot of static files, HTML files. Uh, so 90% of those open buckets contain uh, non-sensitive information. But still, uh, we have to analyze that and uh, come up with a decision whether this information is sensitive or not in order to issue an alert uh, to a company. So that requires a lot of automatic analysis, but also uh, manual analysis based on keywords, uh, specific patterns, etc. So that's that's really looks like a treasure hunting. Uh, but yeah, it's it's never a dull moment there. Yes, I just before the uh, before we recorded this, you, you posted a screenshot on Twitter of a uh, of ransomware, I think, in a and it was in a readme file. Yeah, it was just from today's uh, discovery, we started to look into uh, exposed git config uh, files, which are open uh, left, uh, non protected as part of some development environment. And it appears that uh, Git repositories uh, already contain uh, those warning nodes, ransom nodes, meaning that uh, malicious actors already actively scanning for those instances and uh, insert those files so to create uh, some sort of chance to, to, uh, to extort the money. Yeah, but just to understand that attack, they're attacking GitHub and then taking control? No, that's uh, Git, uh, Git repositories. Uh, so uh, those... So locally hosted Git, Git repository. Okay. Locally hosted Git repositories and externally uh, faced. So it's publicly exposed. Got it. Okay, so MongoDB... I'm not sure when they when they made this change, but they they introduced authentication. Has that significantly lowered the number of open instances that that you find? Indeed, uh, I think it was uh, their one of their er- earlier versions a couple of years ago, uh, and uh, after they introduced the authentication, the number of exposed instances lowered. Uh, however, there was another reason uh, that uh, led to uh, to the extinction of uh, almost extinction of uh, exposed mongos. Uh, there was a huge wave of uh, ransomware attacks uh, targeted specifically at uh, unprotected MongoDBs uh, hosted on default port. Uh, and uh, even now, if you look at the statistics uh, by Shodan, you would notice uh, many uh, readme nodes within uh, uh, MongoDB structures folders. And uh, the size of those Mongos are perhaps 5, 10 kilobytes, meaning that uh, the its content was uh, wiped out by uh, someone who actively scanning default ports for mongos and uh, just destroy the content and uh, put a ransom net note in there so uh, it's still a pretty uh, devastating landscape with the mongodbs out there uh, but uh, so that's 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 another reason that that led to uh, somehow declining the number of the exposed instances uh, that doesn't necessarily means that all those instances were set 
protected. Uh, it's meaning that uh, the information there is so uh, uh, fast destroyed by uh, malicious bots that uh, even ourselves or uh, search engines cannot uh, index it before it already is destroyed by uh, someone exploiting uh, um, an active scanner and uh, destroying the, this information. Uh, however, these days, the, the number of uh, Mongols with uh, non-protected status is growing, uh, even despite the, the authentication measures. Wait, I mean, so authentication is enabled by default, but people are disabling it and then putting it online. Yeah, that's that's pretty common uh, stuff that people do. No matter what environment they use, it can be pretty sophisticated environment with a lot of security alerts, like S3 buckets. Uh, Amazon did a great job in introducing security policies and measures, a lot of warnings and uh, in external ex internal checkups that simply would red flag you that your bucket is publicly exposed but still people ignore it uh, they just uh, put it in public because perhaps it's easier for them to access those files when they work remotely or uh, exchange information internally with an open bucket they they simply can't think of someone finding this bucket name and already started to copy the data. So I was being naive by thinking then that uh, the reason why you expanded your scope beyond Mongo and Elastic was because there aren't any interesting Mongo and Elastic databases that are still open, saying there still yeah. are and it's growing. That's, uh, that's one of the reasons, but still these two are still in our focus. Mm -hmm. So we, we are still looking into them uh, and they, uh, yeah, they, they occupy a lot of our time uh, for analysis. All right. Let's talk a bit about your disclosure process. So you find really interesting open database. What do you do next? How do you figure out who owns it and how do you, how do you get convince them to close it? Sometimes it's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, for example, uh, uh, reverse DNS would uh, point out uh, uh, a domain name. And then uh, it's it's obvious that the database that it hosted on, for example, Microsoft uh, uh, related infrastructure is a part of Microsoft environment, or um, yeah, or, or some someone else's company. Uh, in other cases, when uh, database is hosted on a cloud server, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. And there is no uh, owner's information or this information is redacted for privacy reasons or the owner wants to be anonymous for some, uh, I don't know, for some uh, reason. Uh, then you really need to do uh, this open source intelligence work by uh, searching for any hints and uh, things that would point you in the right direction. For example, administrator's uh, credentials inside a database might contain uh, administrator's email, uh, or uh, there is a specific pattern of uh, uh, a lot of repeating emails, meaning, meaning potentially that the, this email domain might belong to a company that owns the data. So you start to look into different connections between files, folders, uh, collection names. In some cases, even a small uh, collection name or, or abbreviation might lead into uh, exploring the, the, the owner behind the data. So it's, it's some, it takes from minutes up to days, uh, but uh, in 99% of cases, we are lucky to identify the owner and send an alert. An alert uh, in form of an email, which uh, includes information, in introduction about ourselves, about our mission, our goal. So first of all, we know that this is not a sales speech. This is not a extortion or blackmail. 
we really want to alert you on uh, some uh, situation with one of your uh, cloud environments. And then we don't share all the information about the exposed assets because there is a chance that this email might end up in a, in the wrong hands or support staff that might uh, use it in and uh, not properly or somehow copy it so we always wait until someone uh, really responsible for this infrastructure administrator or CISO or CTO or CEOs, at least someone responsible, returns to us. So then we provide full disclosure with all the information about the exposed assets, IPs, etc., how we found it. And uh, yeah, that's that's it. We don't uh, sell our services or somehow push for our consultancy. We we are simply happy that this process is uh and that and uh, the environment is uh protected how often do you have to convince them that after you send the email saying this isn't marketing this isn't sales we're just trying to let you know of an issue i imagine a decent percentage of the time people still don't believe you how often do you have to convince them further that you're that you're legit it happened a lot of times uh a couple of years ago when when I did not have any reputation or any background uh, uh, behind our research. Nowadays, uh, people, I, I see when people start, start to look into my LinkedIn profile or there is a lot of information on Google. So the, in some cases, they simply confirm that uh, using Twitter, for example, or LinkedIn that they talk to the right person. Uh, so it was me who sent an alert. Uh, but uh, nowadays, I don't recall any case when uh, when uh, companies return an email uh, uh, saying that they don't believe me. In such cases, they simply don't reply. So they... That makes they, sense. There are still, uh, still uh, cases when companies don't reply. Uh, especially in summer when there is a lot of vacations and people are outside of their homes or offices. Now, what are the most common explanations when after you, you do a responsible disclosure? What are the most common reasons people tell you oh, why that was left online? Yeah, that's. Uh, I even uh, put together a top 10 uh, funny explanations or not funny explanations uh why uh, what companies uh, put uh in uh, in their emails uh, so the most in some cases they they in really rare cases they uh, provide me with an incident report uh explaining all the details behind the exposure when for example uh, vpn was uh turned off or a uh, firewall uh, was shut down and then it was indexed by by uh, search engine but there are cases when companies simply say that uh, okay thanks but it was testing environment with uh, dummy data so of course it it should not be online but it's not a big deal so it's uh, we yeah we we just made it for purpose, but thank you for for alerting us. Uh, in this case like that, do you push back if you are fairly certain it's valid, or you just say whatever? Uh, yeah, th there were a couple of cases where I when I pushed back, but not too aggressive because at the end of the day, it's not my goal to uh, yeah to to somehow uh, persuade companies or make them. Uh, if you if you act aggressively, then uh, you would be replied aggressively. So that's that's road to nowhere, at least in our. Uh, so I just, uh, in some cases, I publicize uh, those uh, communications anonymously or non-anonymously, and uh, just you know, with the aim to to raise awareness that such things can happen. So don't 
don't act like company A or uh, company B. Yeah, but how, how do you decide what you what you like what breaches you make public? We publicize things when uh, there is uh, a lack of no communications between a uh, company and uh, and us uh, security researchers because uh, in some or yeah in some cases uh, companies uh, silently close the access for example to s3 bucket which contains thousands and thousands of ssn numbers or scanned passwords uh, which we think was online for quite a long time uh, according to search engines uh, indexing time so uh, uh, this is an alarming case and uh, we uh, really want to raise a flag and alert uh, uh, users uh, and authorities about what happens so uh, this is one of those cases when we publicize it uh, in other cases uh, companies are obliged to uh, to report data breach uh, so they consider that a data breach and yeah we also help them to publicize this case using uh, our own uh, look our own incident report so we uh, we help them to reproduce uh, that scenario when it was uh, exposed uh, why it was exposed uh, what search engines picked it up and stuff so yeah Could, do you have any suggestions for the defenders out there how can we avoid being the target of your research <laughs> like how should we, what should we do how do we secure our environment i imagine it has a lot to do with the shadow it because there's probably imagine the bulk of what you're finding are things that people just forgot about so what suggestions do you have for for defenders out there so uh, it's really about uh, simple cyber hygiene rules to follow on a pretty regular basis uh, if you are a small or mid-sized company uh, there is not so many critical IP, ips that you need to keep an eye on so just browsing uh, them through uh, several search engines would help you a lot to understand if those are exposed or somehow indexed even an ssh uh, protocol or some uh, pretty uh, non-sensitive port with a wi-fi router on it might give you uh, an idea that something's wrong with your environment and it's uh, somehow publicly faced and needs a special attention so uh, yeah by simply using those uh, free uh, freemium search engines you can uh, yeah make sure that at least you are protected from uh, from uh, someone browsing through your files even if they are non-sensitive cool do you have any suggestions for people who want to go into security research yeah it's really it's really easy these days uh and it uh, it it always were in uh, in in this uh, internet era so uh, you only have to have uh, um, some sort of internal feeling about what you do is right and uh, uh, it's really not about making money it's not about uh, getting a reward it's you know it's something spiritual even <laughs> in some place in some cases uh, sometimes i found myself like uh, Don Quixote fighting uh, windmills uh, because it's never ending process of uh, alerting and alerting and you don't see uh, an end uh, at the end of tunnel uh, there is no light because people still would make uh, stupid mistakes and errors and uh, unprotected protected stuff but at least there must be someone who would look uh, after their assets uh, with good intentions so if you feel that you are that guy uh, don't hesitate and start learn uh, what it takes to to find that stuff it's it's pretty simple and 
might uh, help you to not only educate yourself, but maybe educate uh, someone around you from your corporate or personal environment. Now, as somebody who runs their own security company as well, any thoughts on, you have this like fine balance where you're doing research for the community, and then you also need to run a business. Any any tips on how to find the right balance between between the two? You know, uh, I never uh, specifically uh, worked on finding that balance. It always found me. What's that mean? Surprisingly, uh, a lot of companies that were uh, alerted uh, uh, by us, they uh, in, in, in a couple of days or weeks, they, they got back to us asking for uh, additional uh, security consultancy, additional uh, penetration testings. Uh, so they were uh, yeah, grateful in a good way. And uh, we... Uh, we we also were uh, yeah, grateful for them that they they came back, but we never uh, push for that. So that's that's perhaps the the key uh, the key factor. Uh, we we never considered that as a business, but it appeared that it might uh, return as a business, uh, and that's the balance uh, appeared organically. So it's. Uh, it's it's hard to explain, but it's like that. So it's working. That is, yeah, that is an amazing uh, <laughs> marketing channel. But like you're doing so much good, and then the uh, the karma or what have you comes yeah, back. Yeah. And uh, and I prefer to think about it in in that way. So it's it's pretty much karma that uh, act with people like you want them to act on you. So that's. That's how it works. Yeah, I like what you said before we started recording. I asked you what your superpower was, and you said honesty. And I mean, you're finding huge amounts of very sensitive data, handling it responsibly, and you're able to juggle doing good and running a security business at the same time, which is amazing. So, if people want to learn more about you, where where can they find you? Uh, I I'm regularly on Twitter. Uh, at Mayhem Day One, my my good old days nickname, uh, and uh, uh, LinkedIn, it's where I am uh, all the time, as well. Uh, plus, uh, on uh, our own securitydiscovery.com uh, blog platform, where we sometimes put our reports as well. There are contact information there. But yeah, start from Twitter and. Yeah, we can take it from there. Awesome. Bhavdi Yachenko, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for inviting me. That was a pleasure. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for listening and leaving reviews. If you have any comments or questions, I'd love to hear from you. I'm at Jamus on Twitter. Or drop me an email at podcast at breachins.io. And if you're part of a security team that needs visibility into your employees, customers, or third-party suppliers' breach credentials before criminals exploit them, head on over to breachins.io to apply for a free seven-day trial. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back in your earbuds next Thursday morning.